So it was this huge hope somehow, maybe yeah, then a change is coming super fast. Even when we had this huge strike with hundreds of thousands of people in different cities, the politics didn't change. What are you going to do if they if they don't respond? Governments, um, you know, they were really scared, I think, of the protests back in 2019. And that's why we had all those declarations of um, climate emergency and all the greenwashing, really. I attribute that to them being scared and wanting to pretend and show that, hey, we are doing something. Mm. Um, because before that, before those times, they didn't even go through the trouble of that, right? They, they just outright did it. Um, now they're at least pretending that they're not. So we just have to push them a little bit more. I definitely think that regardless of what the term we're using, we should be engaging with um, worker struggles uh, because it's connected. So today with us, we have Mitzi Janelle Chan, who is a climate justice activist from the Philippines and one of the founders of Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines, which is uh, the Filipino equivalent of Fridays of Future. Before we start, my name is Elias König, and the interview that you're listening to is part of a whole series of interviews I conducted for a research project at Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies. In these interviews, I ask many amazing activists and researchers from different communities what it means for them to strike for climate justice and to share their thoughts on the future of the movement. I learned so much from these conversations and I hope that they can be valuable to you too. If you have any thoughts, please do not hesitate to comment here or to get in touch directly. But now, without further ado, here's the episode. So hi everyone, I am Mitzi Janelle Tan. I am with Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines, but I also organize internationally with Fridays for Future and Fridays for Future MAPA, which is most affected peoples and areas. I am 24 years old and I am based in Rizal, Philippines, which is really near Metro Manila, if that's what you guys know. <laughs> uh, what I'm currently working on in the Philippines, we are assessing what's gonna happen because we have a new um, president and a new vice president. So we're seeing what their climate plans will look like. It's a lot of about, about it's a lot about fighting for democracy and social justice as well, because um, the track record of these two politicians has not been great for environmental defenders and human rights. So there's that and also the aspect of adaptation and internationally it's still calling for reparations, especially for loss and damages and adaptation for global South countries. Um, yeah. Cool. And perhaps you could also say a bit more about how you got into all of these topics. What is uh, what is your own um, climate activism journey? I basically grew up with the climate crisis, seeing the impact of the typhoons on my community and my country, really seeing whole homes and communities and subdivisions just consumed by floods. Um, but the funny thing is that the way climate change was taught in school is that it was about melting ice caps and polar bears and not about what we were already experiencing. And while I did start to care about climate change at a young age, because my teachers told me that smoking was the reason behind the climate crisis, which is not true. Um, but because I had a lung problem and I knew smoking was bad for me, I actually would go up to people and tell them about global warming, carbon dioxide emissions, and how smoking is bad for the planet and the people. So there was that spirit in me, but it was misinformed and it really didn't come from a place of right information. And so um, that kind of went away when I learned that smoking wasn't actually the reason behind the climate crisis. But I still did not know that climate change was what we were experiencing and that it wasn't until much later on when, it, when I was able to talk to a Lumad indigenous leader. This was in 2017 and she was telling us about how they were being harassed and displaced and militarized and killed all for protecting their ancestral land, our forests. And then so simply he shrugged and chuckled and said, that's why we have no choice but to fight back. And it was so simple to him, even though it's so dangerous to be an activist in the Philippines, it was so simple to him that we have no choice but to fight back. And I realized then that I had to join the struggle. That was when I had to really commit myself to activism. At that time, I was already going to some protests, either student rights protests or environmental protests. But that was when I decided, OK, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm putting time and energy into. This is what I'm committing to. This is what I'm choosing. Right. And um, I guess um, you are then also one of the co-founders of the 
uh, Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines, and as you said, also involved internationally. So how did that come about? Um, was that also informed by um, your previous experiences, but also um, how did you become involved in this global movement? I started climate protesting, I guess, in 2017. It started because of this movement called March for Science, which is which stemmed in the US when Donald Trump said that climate change isn't real. So scientists from the US started protesting um, and it started popping up across the world. I was part of a youth science for the people organization back then called Agham Youth. Um, so I was helping to organize that in 2018. And then in 2019, we realized that we needed a youth led climate movement specifically um, that had the word climate in the name. That's why it's my Fridays for Future. But we, because no one knew who Fridays for Future was in the Philippines, no one knew what the climate crisis was really, or that it was something that people are causing. Um, if people knew it, it was because, oh, climate change, environment, typhoons, but it, as if it was a natural event and not that fossil fuel industries were causing it. So we said that we needed a youth-led climate movement. So we set up YACAP, which is an alliance of individuals and organizations. Um, then we started doing our global climate strike in September, 2019. Um, unlike other Fridays for Future groups, we don't protest every Friday. Um, instead, we, before the pandemic, we would go to schools and talk um, to students and teachers about the climate crisis. And then during the pandemic, it's still about that raising awareness um, through social media and online platforms instead. And why was it so important for you um, that the movement is youth-led? We saw that there was a certain message that wasn't being put out there because it wasn't youth-led. I mean, we were helping lead it, but we weren't, it was like a, a bunch of us, like everyone. Um, and while the scientist-led um, perspective was really important, it wasn't necessarily reaching people who weren't scientists. Mm -hmm. So we needed something that was youth-led because we saw that a lot of young people started caring. A lot of young people were looking for a way to start their activism, um, but they didn't know how. It was scary to start because of the dangers of activism here in the Philippines. So we were like, we need one that's for us. Um, and we will be in connection with all these other movements as well, but we need one that is youth-led. Right, right. And uh, yeah, how has the movement developed since? I mean, in 2019, there were some really big strikes around the world, but today we can see that, I guess, um, there has been a lot of declarations of climate emergencies and so on, but in terms of the uh, amount of uh, um, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we haven't seen the change that uh, I think many people hoped for. So um, what's your... What's your take on how the movement developed then? And why do you think also that governments and, and businesses respond the way they, they did to this movement? I think the huge protests in 2019 were so important to make sure that climate change became a dinner table topic, became a topic that everyone is talking about and knew. It's so important for that first stage of awareness. Um, even if a lot of the messaging that came out was it's a problem of the future um, and that we have this amount of years left when really the climate crisis is already here. It was still crucial to make sure that people understood what climate change was. And since then, uh, the dynamics have changed mostly because the pandemic also started in 2020, just when the climate movement was like starting to rise up and then um, the pandemic hit and suddenly our, our biggest tool, our biggest um, tactic, uh, which are bringing people outside in the streets is not allowed because it's not safe. Um, especially at the start of the pandemic when that was what experts were saying. Now experts have told us that protesting is fine as long as we follow all the rules, et cetera. But at the beginning of the pandemic, we really had to adjust um, both nationally in the Philippines and uh, internationally. But I think there was something really special around that time because suddenly you could reach more people because everything was online. There were no more borders in that sense. Of course, there is that socioeconomic barrier where people who don't have access to the internet or don't have as good internet um, won't be able to participate. But it was a time when the international movement came together more. 
Um, before that, there wasn't a lot of coordination, there wasn't a lot of communication, especially between Global North groups and Global South groups, like the European groups were able to talk to each other because they're so close to each other. Um, and there's the good public transport uh, or whatever across the continent. But um, at the start of the pandemic, that was when people from across countries and across continents, across cultures started to come together and really learn from each other. And I think that was so crucial because that was when I would say Fridays for Future started to be on the track of becoming more intersectional. Um, because in the global south, a lot of our movements were really clear to us how, you know, it's not just about the environment, it's not just about the future, it's also about social economic issues, class inequality, gender inequality. Um, but it became more concrete and solidified when you know, you're actually able to talk to someone who is experiencing that, who has seen that, who is experiencing the climate crisis already. And so our understanding of climate injustice gets better and gets deeper in that sense. So I think it was a really important time um, that we were starting to connect together. And then now we're seeing how governments um, you know, they were really scared, I think, of the protests back in 2019. And that's why we had all those declarations of um, climate emergency and all the greenwashing, really. I attribute that to them being scared and wanting to pretend and show that, hey, we are doing something. Mm. Um, because before that, before those times, they didn't even go through the trouble of that, right? They, they just outright did it. Um, now they're at least pretending that they're not. So we just have to push them a little bit more so that they actually do what, what um, they're pretending to do. Yeah, and I'm really curious, you said uh, that uh, in your impression, the movement became a lot more intersectional during the um, COVID years, I guess, 2020, 21. How, how did that uh, pan out? Was it, was it also the debates around Black Lives Matter that played a role? Um, and also how, how, how was it institutionally um, I guess, what's the, what, when did, or what, <laughs> actually, this is my, my own interest as well. When did, when did uh, Fridays for Future MAPA really uh, constitute itself? And, and was that also in that context? Um, hold on, let me, I keep confusing the date. So I'm just gonna check really quickly. Sure. <laughs> um, okay, I, I have it right. Um, so, during the Black Lives Matter protests, that really made an impact in Fridays for Future as well. I think it made an impact across the world in understanding how important intersectionality is. So it was a time of social awakening. I think the COVID pandemic also just showed how rotten our existing systems are. It really exposed how horrible the systems are, especially for marginally um, oppressed communities already. So they, we saw, especially in countries in the global south, how really unprepared our health systems are for any sort of crisis and also in the global north, right? So it was a time when the existing problems kind of just got amplified. So people saw it easily, right? So it saw it more easily. Um, it was in preparation for the September 2020 global climate strike. Let me wait for the dogs. I'm so sorry. Very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're they're noisiest when I'm on recorded um calls. When they're when it's not recorded, right, they right. never bark. It's, <laughs> it's okay. Um okay there. Um so yeah, Fridays for Future Map has started um around a few months before the September 2020 global climate strike because that year, that was the same year that we all started meeting each other around March, right? Um around February or March, and we started seeing that there was a need for Global South voices and an amplification for that. And then around maybe August um, or July, we saw that, hey, we need our own space. And it was really just supposed to be that in the beginning, just a, a group chat for us to talk to each other, to rant, to share common experiences with each other. But there was a lot of support around the idea of this Fridays for Future MAPA from the Global North also, from Global North activists. There was a lot of interest in getting to know our voices. So it was interesting because you know people were afraid to speak up. People were afraid to say stuff and to participate, um, but people actually wanted them to participate. It was this systemic barrier that came from, you know, previous and past trauma and not really something that 
might have stemmed from the actual spaces. Um, so we created that space and then the support just kind of came in and then the September 2020 global climate strike was when we kind of launched the idea of MAPA. We told everyone to do their global climate strikes with MAPA and then we made the symbol, which means, well, we didn't make it. This is a, this is a sign language for solidarity, but we made it kind of like our symbol and we put like a tagline that was like, hold on, why do I not know it? Um, unheard, but not voiceless fighting for our present, not just our future, we will not be prisoners of injustice. And we told everyone to just remember those three things about MAPA, right? We're not voiceless. We don't need your voice for unheard. Uh, we're not just fighting for the future, we're fighting for this present and that we will all not be prisoners of injustice. And those three key lines I think was so important and getting that message across. And I'm surprised by the impact that it has today that other climate groups I see are also sometimes using the term MAPA. Um, uh, I'm seeing like people that I've never met. I I don't know at all, but they have like Fridays for Future MAPA stuff in their in their places. Or like I when I was able to go to protests in Europe, I saw people like having signs that said stand with MAPA, and I didn't realize really how the extent of the impact that that small thing did. That small like step started but it was really cool because now like there is a lot more support i'm not saying that price reduction is completely intersectional i think we're now at the point where learning is harder because we've learned the basics so now it's like the more difficult more nuanced more um yeah the more difficult things to learn about intersectionality and the more nuanced things and there's a lot more to handle but it is a learning process and it is a breathing movement which i think is so important to remember right yeah i think that's a good segue into um the the topic of the climate strike which i also wanted to talk about with you i mean um i i think the the appropriation of the term strike by the movement is very interesting uh, because it it is the core tactic of many social movements uh, the their labor strikes their uh, women's strikes, feminist strikes, anti-racist strikes. So, um, yeah, how, how do you think about this term climate strike? And actually, um, did you choose, uh, did you use this term at all in the Philippines as well? Or did you uh, choose another name to call your demonstrations? This is a very interesting topic for me because we did have these discussions, especially in 2019 when you we were starting, about the term strike, because it is something that is connected to the labor movement, especially here in the Philippines. And to strike means to stop production for us. Um, so unless you're doing that, unless you're huge enough to actually stop production in like big places, then it's not a strike, it's a protest. Um, what we did was we used the global climate strike name as like an event name for the PubMat, the, the the, the graphics, the media advisories, but then when explaining to people, we do call it the protest. Um, so we needed to do that because otherwise, if we called it global climate protest, uh, media would not pay attention to us. The schools that we were inviting would not pay attention to us. The students we were inviting would not pay attention to us because the term that they knew was global climate strike. Um, but we did consult with the labor movement here and, and they were like, yeah, that, that works. And I think it really depends on each um, country and each you know, con social movement context on how you use the term strike. I know that I have talked to the International Trade Union Confederation and they were like, some of them, I don't know how all of them think, but the ones that I was able to talk to, they said that um, it, it's okay, it, you guys are doing something that's similar to it, especially in some countries that are actually doing huge protests and demonstrations. Um, but it's it's important to remember that it can't like strikes. They don't stop at protests. They don't stop at the on street action. There are concrete demands um, when you strike, and that's something that the climate movement really has to follow up on. And it's difficult because you can't have international demands because it's different for a country. So you will have just general demands internationally, like reparations, etc adaptation and all these things but then it's up to each country each context each community to really concretize how that looks so in the philippines we have a lot more concrete demands um, and this is something that we're really pushing uh, that every country has and i think more and more countries are starting to have those really concrete demands and what it looks like i remember 
opposed to the beginning of the climate movement when a lot of our answers were like, listen to the experts, listen to the scientists. Um, why are you asking us for answers? But now it's like, you know what? Sure, here, this is what we want, right? And, and I think it's a powerful tool to use. Right. And as, as you said, I think so far, uh, climate strikes um, have mainly been school strikes, I guess, um, or strikes by young people that is strikes in the in the sphere of reproduction, people saying, okay, I will withdraw myself from this system for one day. Um, but uh, oil companies and coal companies, they don't really feel the, um, the brunt of a climate strike, they can probably just keep extracting oil, even on the climate strike day when 6 million people are striking for climate justice. So do you think, uh, um, do you think this term is worth pursuing as at all in the sense that perhaps a climate strike could be thought much broader? Perhaps uh, we should actually engage uh, or support struggles in production and, and uh, other kind of strike movements? Or do you think um, now coming out of the pandemic, we need a totally different strategy? I definitely think that regardless of what the term we're using, we should be engaging with um, worker struggles uh, because it's connected, um, especially worker struggles in fossil fuel companies. Um, so often I've seen how there is, it's sometimes climate activists and workers in fossil fuel companies are pit, put against each other, like they're enemies, but we're not. We're, we're, that's why the just transition call is so important and you can't do that and you can't call for that without consulting with your workers um, in the fossil fuel industries themselves. Um, so regardless of the term we're using, you have to use that. I think the main purpose of climate strikes, especially in the beginning, was raising awareness about climate change because that is so important. Um, raising awareness, reaching people, getting people to understand what it is, and then bringing people into the movement. Um, I think at this point, it is just the name. It doesn't really matter what uh, you use it, what, what you call it, because global climate strike is already something that people know, people recognize, people understand. You could still call it a climate protest. I think people will still understand it, but it's not where our energy should go into, into like changing the word, right? right? It's about changing what we're doing and what we're reaching. So it's about getting more concrete demands, getting more intersectional, supporting campaigns, connecting campaigns. One of the favorite things I do when, with this international movement is when global campaigns get connected. So we did that last year um, with a bank, in, uh, with a UK bank, um, Standard Chartered Bank, which would um, finance fossil fuel companies, mostly in the global south. So those global south countries, we all did a campaign together and with the UK um, Fridays for Future also. And so you had this really strong movement. And now Fridays for Future Japan and Fridays for Future Bangladesh are doing a joint campaign against, I'm going to get this wrong, Sumitomo Bank or something, um, because that bank is financing fossil fuel in Bangladesh. And they were able to stop um, the financing of one of the, the, the fossil fuel projects or companies by that bank just recently. So it's these... These are the types of campaigns that we need to get better at because they are so strong because they are concrete, they help doing things and they also bring people more in because now you have the people in the country where that's causing the climate crisis and the people in the country that are feeling the climate crisis connecting. Right. And one of the things that is also so interesting about these campaigns is that they don't actually um, only address the government, but they they are not shy to directly address also the companies in question and uh, to protest against capital directly. And so I wanted to ask you, do you think that is a worthwhile shift uh, when in the beginning Fridays for Future demonstrations were often held in front of parliaments and like uh, very consciously only addressing, I think, political leaders? Um, do you think that also this wider range of targets is something that that we can see in the movement and it should be supported i think we should do both because the bigger long-term thing is to target governments because they're the ones who can put in policies which will stop everything but the more immediate stuff is when you target companies and if you're able to get one company to stop that helps a lot concretely right now so we need to do both um, and I know that that sounds difficult, but it is something that we should learn to balance really 
understanding when to take on this sort certain messaging, when to take on this certain campaign. And there is a lot of us enough to be able to do that. So that's also important to remember that we don't have to do every single thing. And like each activist doesn't have to do all the campaigns and each group does not have to do all the campaigns. And that's all right. Yes, absolutely. So we've already talked a little bit about uh, strategic implications for for now, what we should do, but I'm curious just um, just to complete the sort of historical um, uh, chronology that we've we've sort of had throughout this conversation. How did you now perceive like the the last few months, or maybe starting from the protest last year in in Glasgow, which was sort of the I think first bigger protests after the two years of pandemic? Um, do you think there is a, a, a like a a reawakening of the movement at the same time we've seen like um the war in ukraine and, and other topics have also taken up a lot of attention so uh, how do you see uh, the last few months and how do you see the movement coming um coming out in 2022 i think the last few months a lot of it, it's a mix of how COVID also started COVID restrictions started to um, loosen up in a lot of places. So we started to do more on ground things again. Um, so there was not as much international coordination in the past few months in the sense that, in the same sense that we did before um, when everything was online, but we still had that essence of being connected and the connections that we've already made. Um, so that was really crucial. And now we're seeing how that might play into this more. Um, the start of the at uh, the start of the year also when you know with the war um of russia and ukraine we're seeing how a lot more people started to realize how fossil fuels um, played a role in in imperialist war um something that our activists from um southwest swana southwest asia north africa or the middle east um have been saying for for years now um but you know have been ignored um people started realizing that now that, okay, yes, they were right. Um, fossil fuels do have a, play, a role to play in war and it is something that's connected and something that we need to look into and, and fight against as well. Um, so I think this period was a learning moment for a lot of the, for the general movement to understand how, again, in, how intersectional the climate crisis is and how intersectional it has to be. And now, preparing for COP27, which is going to be in Egypt, which is in Africa, one of the first um, Global South COPs in, in a while, uh, because all of them have been in Europe the past few years. Um, it's going to be interesting how the dynamics will change and how we have to be creative, I guess, and how we're going to do actions there, because Egypt does not allow protests. So now your biggest tool, again, the global climate strike or the, the protests on the streets is something that we might not be able to do um, in this country without putting ourselves or the people we're leaving behind, like the organizers in Egypt at risk, right? So that's something that we have to consider now. Um, so that's gonna be an interesting thing to look at. Um, that's how 2022 is looking. I think in 2022 now we've also um, learn to have more specific demands and be more connected with each other. So like the campaigns I was telling you about with uh, Japan and Bangladesh, um, I think there's another one with France and Uganda with Total and the Eastern African Food Oil Pipeline. Um, they're starting, they were starting this year. Um, so those are things that are we're seeing more and more how we're not as internationally, we're not talking as much internationally in terms of communication, like constantly, but the coordination is still there with campaigns. Cool, so lots to expect. Um, is that also, I mean, I'm curious, do you personally, what you're working on right now is this like COP, COP27 in Egypt, um, how are things looking in the Philippines? Maybe you can say a bit more about how the next few months will look like for you. So for the next few months, it will be working on COP27, getting activists there, um, working a lot on loss and damages and reparations and really drilling down that message. Uh, in the Philippines, it will be similarly about that because 
our president seems to have been, he was invited to go to COP27 by Egypt. So we'll see what happens there. Um, we're also going to be working a lot about our democracy and social justice campaign because of how dangerous it is for environmental defenders under this presidency. Um, and this president is also pushing nuclear energy as renewable energy um, because his father set up a nuclear power plant years ago but was stopped by people's movements because it's not safe for the environment, for people, etc. Um, so there's going to be a lot of stuff around that also. And just always the work around climate awareness is still constantly going. And when there are typhoons, there is always like a relief operations and donations come in. Um, so that's the stuff that we'll be working on. Sounds exciting. Um, and I think uh, a good way to end. Thank you so much for taking the time, Mitzi. And um, thank, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the interview. Feel free to check out the other episodes as well. And I hope you have a great day wherever you are. <laughs>